the business committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for the debate. And as two amendments have been selected and are published in the Marshall list, an additional 15 minutes has been added to the total time. Uh, can I advise you uh, that you will have 10 minutes to propose the motion and a further 10 minutes to wind? To wind. Please, uh, I invite you to open the debate on the motion. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to have uh, this opportunity on behalf of the SDLP to present this motion uh, to the House. What should be clear is that the causes of violent crime are complex and that there is no single simple solution. This motion and the amendment from Sinn Féin, which we accept, acknowledges this fact. I am pleased that the Minister for Justice is in attendance for the debate, but acknowledge not, that not all of the solutions lie with her department. Tackling violent crime will require an approach that spans right across government. Statistics show that violent crime is increasing. In the 12 months from the 1st of January to the 31st of December 2019, there were 106,604 crimes recorded in Northern Ireland. This is an increase of 7,300 on the previous 12 months and continuing the increase seen during 2018-19. Violence against the person increased 14.1 per cent. That equates to 4,975 offences. The biggest rise was in the category violence without injury, which should be seen in light of changes in recording practice with the harassment classification. Progress is being made with the reporting of hate crime, and I look forward to the outcome of Judge Desmond Murray's review. Hate crime is, of course, a motivating factor in many crimes against the person. Tragically, last year there were 26 homicides, whilst a further 167 people died or were seriously injured as a direct consequence of unlawful driving. Behind these statistics are hundreds of personal tragedies, the lives lost, families left bereaved and many others having to struggle with life-changing injuries. Our thoughts are with them today. Police statistics also tell us that there were 983 reported rapes and 2,434 other sexual offences. Crimes against society are also increasing, with 951 drug trafficking offences and 6,957 drug possession offences. Minister, I welcome your commitment and that of your predecessor, Ms. Claire Sugden, to putting in place stronger legislation to tackle domestic and sexual violence. Across Northern Ireland, eight of the 11 policing districts showed an increase in domestic abuse incidents, and all 11 had higher, le higher levels of domestic abuse crimes. I believe we can all acknowledge the fact that both of these crimes are vastly underreported. Much more needs to be done. The comprehensive report by Judge Gillen sets out some 253 recommendations across the criminal justice system, many of which will require additional financial resources if we are serious about supporting victims and bringing perpetrators before the courts. But many others challenge government to work more collaboratively together and smarter. Therefore, Minister, I'm sure we will all be keen to hear your response uh, and the steps taken to date and your implementation plan to address those recommendations. I also welcome the high priority given to tackle domestic and sexual violence by the PSNI and the Northern Ireland Policing Board in the draft policing plan for the year ahead. And here I declare an interest as a member of the policing board. The establishment of a domestic homicide review team will also hopefully help agencies to better understand and red flag vulnerable individuals to allow for earlier intervention and prevention. The changing drugs market is identified as one of the drivers of the increase in violent crime. The role of alcohol-fueled violence is also well documented. Substance misuse is properly reflected in the New Decade New Approach document, and I welcome the focus of the Health Minister, Robin Swan, to develop a strategy both to improve services and take innovative and effective action to reduce alcohol and drug-related harm. The recent focus on low-level drug dealing and tackling the availability of illegal prescription drugs online must continue to be a priority for the PSNI. Community confidence in policing will be judged on how well the police respond to this low-level but high community impact of this type of behaviour. But law enforcement of itself is not the only solution. 
At this point, I must add that there's little I can disagree with in the amendment put forward by the DUP, but it practically rewrites the motion and focuses almost exclusively on a criminal justice response. Therefore, I cannot accept the amendment. Earlier intervention supporting families such as the Sure Start programme must continue to be funded by the Minister for Communities. More investment is needed to provide secure homes for those fleeing violence and their children. I trust, Minister, this is an issue you will pick up with your ministerial co uh, colleague, Ms Hargay. No debate on the preva prevalence of violent crime would be complete without attempting to outline the causal factors and the absolute requirement to have, as our motion calls for, a resource implementation plan to reduce offending and reoffending. It is accepted by the Older Persons Commissioner that older people are less likely to be victims of crime, but whilst not diminishing the trauma experienced by older victims of crime, this subject will be debated more fully tomorrow and I will concentrate more on younger people. According to the World Health Organization, being male is the greatest risk factor, with the 15 to 29 year old men accounting for three quarters of all victims of homicide globally. Being male not only increases the likelihood of being the victim of violence, but also increases their likelihood of being the perpetrator of violent acts. Our prison population profile underlines this fact. There is a wealth of academic research pinpointing the key risk factors and individuals most at risk of being either victims or perpetrators. This includes a growing inequalities between the haves and the have-nots, hopeless job prospects for many of our young people, the collapse of youth service provision through funding cuts, the crisis in mental health care, school failure and expulsion, and outcomes for looked after children. We need to break the cycle of violence. Any approach will depend on partnerships across a number of sectors such as education, health, social services, housing, youth services, probation and victim services. In particular, it needs the support of communities working together to support measures aimed at getting young people and young adults involved in pos positive activities. I welcome the reintroduction of neighbourhood policing teams across all council DAs and hope that the recent PSNI recruitment campaign will enable the Chief Constable to quickly fill the current gaps in provision. I must, however, remind the Minister the additional 400 officers have been funded through additional money secured for Brexit planning. They will need additional financial commitment by her department beyond the next two years. And as Chair of the Partnership Committee, I was pleased uh, that our recent work enabled the focus to be returned to placing neighbourhood teams across all areas. This was a key priority for the then uh, SEC, now Deputy Chief Constable Mark Hamilton, in his delivery on local policing. And I'm sure, Mr. S Deputy Speaker, we can all relate to the fact that neighbourhood policing teams are the eyes and ears uh, of, uh, of the police and can uh, enable earlier interventions and identify uh, those most likely to be engaged in crime and in antisocial behaviour. Uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we propose therefore that a collaborative approach across a number of departments is the only way forward and recognise the key roles both for the Justice Minister and Health Minister have in driving forward societal change and in saving lives. I commend this motion to the House. I beg to move the motion as amended in the names of Linda Dillon and colleagues. I now call Paul Given to move amendment number one. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I rise to move the amendment in my name and that of my colleagues, uh, the member for North Andrum, uh, Mervyn Storey. And can, can I ask, invite the member to take a seat again? Uh, just to confirm that you will have ten minutes to move the amendment and a further five minutes to wind, and you may now open the debate. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, th this amendment seeks to enhance the motion as before us. I, I would disagree with the characteri characterisation of it by um, Ms Kelly, it, it certainly does not take away from what the original motion had in it. It adds to it. Uh, there is nothing removed in terms of what the original motion had, but it does enhance it. And on that basis, I would hope that it will gain uh, support. Uh, I, I can say on the record of no difficulty with the uh, subsequent amendment that was put forward um, by Linda Dillon uh, and would be happy uh, to support that if it uh, came to it. Uh, in, in terms of the issue raised, I want to thank uh, the members for raising this important issue because it is something that affects uh, Northern Ireland uh, in a very serious way. Uh, it has an impact on the individual victims that 
uh, have to suffer the violence perpetrated against them, and that manifests itself in many different forms. Uh, but it also then has a wider impact upon their family, uh, their friends, uh, and the local community. Whenever uh, an incident of uh, such uh, of a violent nature takes place, the ripple effect on that uh, does have a very broad impact, and, uh, and so it's right uh, that we seek to have a criminal justice system uh, and a wider response from society that seeks to address that. I wish we were able to say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, we were winning the battle on this, but the figures don't indicate that. Uh, it shows that there is an increasing uh, number of offences that are taking place, and uh, some of those facts have already been alluded to. But in terms of current figures, from the 1st of February 2019 up until the end of uh, last month, uh, 31st of January, violence against the person uh, was up by 14.3 per cent. The total number of offences relating to violence against the person was almost 41,000. Uh, and in terms of, of those figures within that, nearly three and a half thousand related to sexual offences. Uh, clearly, there's a lot more crimes being committed than there are in terms of successful prosecution and sentencing taking place. Uh, and so, to look at it purely through the lens of the sentences that have occurred would be to mask the problem that exists in our society when it comes to violent uh, crime. Uh, concerning within that. Uh, are the figures that a third of all violence against the person uh, were domestically motivated. Uh, and there have been some horrendous examples of domestic violence leading uh, to murder. I can think of one recently in Newry, which was a most horrific case uh, of uh, uh, violence that took place there uh, that led uh, to deaths taking place through murder. Uh, and there are other examples that members will be able to uh, bring to this debate. Uh, and so domestic violence is something uh, that this Assembly is now rightly going to be looking at, uh, particularly around then the coercive control aspect of it. But as we take the domestic abuse bill through the House, uh, I've no doubt that members uh, from across the chamber will have a particular interest to ensure that we have the most effective legislation in this area, given the level of crime that takes place within it. Uh, the number of recorded domestic abuse crimes from the 1st of January 2019 until the end of uh, last year sat at just over 18,000, which is the highest of any 12-month recording period since 2004-05. These are horrific statistics, and as members have already said, behind each of those figures there are individuals, there are families impacted by it. Uh, and this type of crime is appalling uh, and is getting worse as opposed to uh, reduced. When we look also at uh, injury caused by reckless driving, the number of fatalities as a result of it, but also those that are left uh, with severe uh, life-changing injuries. I have been dealing with a constituent of mine, a lovely girl, who uh, was out in the car and her boyfriend was driving recklessly, subsequently had a conviction for it, left paralysed, life-changing, the impact that that's had on her, on her family, and when it came to the sentencing of it, huge disappointment at the sentence that was passed down in the courts. And it continued to inflict trauma on that individual and on that family because of the inadequacy of the sentence. And for many people, the sentence does not fit the crime that is perpetrated against them, not just when it comes to driving offences, uh, but across the, the area to do with sentencing for all of these crimes. And so that's why I welcome that the former minister who's here today, Claire Sugden, uh, initiated a, re a sentencing review, and it covers a broad range of issues. That consultation concluded earlier uh, in February, and I look forward to seeing the outworkings of some of those uh, proposals being taken forward. Uh, I, I recognise that when it comes to sentencing, there needs to be judicial discretion. There needs to be a framework that can take into various different uh, factors. What are those aggravating factors? What are the mitigating circumstances? Uh, and it is right that there is a broad framework <coughs> by which then the judiciary can look at each individual case. Uh, it's not something that I particularly advocate uh, that parliaments should be specifying precisely whenever a crime takes place. This is the exact form of sentencing that ought to occur. 
uh, but I can understand why members often want to bring forward proposals around minimum sentencing, particularly around attacks on our elderly uh, and in other spheres. And so th this will be something, uh, Deputy Speaker, that as we see the outworkings of uh, the consultation that's now concluded into the sentencing review, uh, that I would like uh, to see more detail on and look forward to hearing from the Minister in respect of that consultation uh, process. It's been touched upon that some of the causation factors around this include uh, the increasing offences around drug abuse, around alcohol misuse, and undoubtedly uh, the impact of alcohol has a huge uh, influence when it comes to offences that take place. Uh, since 2012-13, around half of all violence with injury offences and a third of violence without injury offences have been given an alcohol motivation. And often you hear alcohol being glamorised and people talk about going out and celebrating their big wins by not just having you know, the odd one or two glasses, but people boastfully talking about getting drunk in excess. And I think we need to be very careful about the message that we send out when it comes to alcohol consumption. That's not to say that we ban alcohol, but it's important that we recognise that when we look in our accident and emergency departments, how many people are there as a result of alcohol misuse? When we look at crimes being committed as a result of alcohol misuse, this is a serious problem for this society and something that I don't believe legislation can necessarily address, but we need to take a different approach when it comes to alcohol abuse and the way in which all of that is managed. So I want to thank Yes, I'll give away to Mr. Kana. <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul, Mr. Given. Um, I, I hope you'll agree with me that within the controlled atmosphere of a public house, those publicans sell that drink. And from my own personal view, the day of the drunk man was finished in the bars 20 years ago. You just don't see them. But most of this abuse is fueled at home by cheap off sales and people drink at home, but not coming from that controlled environment which is catered for within the structures of a public house. I th and the member uh, makes, I think, a very important contribution because he's right. Uh, and it is that. Uh, preparation for going out on the town and so to speak where people are preloading uh, and they'll go then to the public house when they've already consumed significant amounts of alcohol and so on uh, and the, the publican often uh, will take a very responsible approach to, to manage in that particular issue so he does raise an important point that's why I do support minimum pricing uh, because it shouldn't be as cheap as it is in purchasing alcohol from off licenses and from our supermarkets and so on and so there needs to be a much more robust piece of legislation in respect of that, and I look forward to that being taken forward. So I do uh, thank the members for bringing this forward. Uh, it's a very important debate. Uh, I, I agree that there needs to be an action plan that addresses uh, a lot of the factors that are talked about, including uh, within the amendment that was put forward by uh, Linda Dillon opposite. Uh, but there can be no excuse for crime emanating from anywhere, whether that's in middle-class areas or no excuse when it comes to socially deprived areas as well. Some of the, 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 the biggest criminal hotspots that exist are people that are residing in very affluent parts of this province. Uh, and, but it is important that we look in detail around these issues. I would support a cross-departmental uh, approach to an action plan to address these underlying issues. And I look forward to working with the Minister for Justice in regards to specific pieces of legislation that can help uh, address these issues that have been raised in the motion. And I would commend the amendment. I now call on Pat Sheehan to move amendment number two. I will ask Count Corda. Um, I do not doubt that everyone uh, in this chamber order, today. Order. Uh, I am asking you to, to, to confirm that you are going to move amendment number two. I will ask Count Corda. I am going to move amendment number two. Thank you. And uh, just ask the Assembly to note that amendments number one and two are mutually exclusive and therefore. Uh, if number, amendment number one is made, uh, the question will not be put on amendment number two. And just to confirm, you will have ten minutes to move the motion and five minutes to wind. And then in the course of this debate, all other speakers will have five minutes. And I now invite you to open up the debate on amendment number two. I will ask So I will start again. 
Uh, I don't doubt that, uh, there's, uh, that anyone in here from whatever background or whatever party they're from uh, wouldn't like to see a, decre a decrease in all crime, and particularly in violent crime and a reduction in reoffending. And that said, there will be disagreement among us about how that can be achieved. And I welcome uh, the Minister for Justice here today. And I agree totally with what Dolores Kelly said in her contribution, that the Justice Minister uh, can't solve the issue of crime or violent crime. In fact, herself, uh, the police and the whole criminal justice system can't deal with that issue. There needs to be uh, collaboration among all departments uh, within the executive. And in, in my view, there are three principal ways of making inroads into crime and reoffending. There's the use of legislation, there's early intervention, and there's rehabilitation. And dealing firstly with legislation, uh, it's clear from the evidence that legislation can and does have an impact on behaviours. And if you want an example of that, you just need to look to the laws on the wearing of seat belts or spoken in public places. Uh, and of course, one of the most eagerly awaited pieces of legislation will come before this assembly shortly uh, in the form of the domestic abuse bill. And I welcome uh, 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 the, uh, the advent of that uh, bill. And I suppose at this stage, I should pay tribute to the previous Justice Minister, Claire Sugden, who did much of the heavy lifting around this particular issue, but unfortunately didn't get enough time uh, to see it through to a conclusion. However, legislation on its own is not a panacea for domestic violence, and there needs to be better education and greater cultural changes among the male population in particular before we will make inroads into this scourge of society. Early intervention is vital if we're serious about tackling the root causes of crime. And uh, while I was a member of the policing board, one of the most memorable and powerful presentations that we received was from a police officer from Police Scotland. And he opened the presentation with uh, a, a short piece of CCTV, quite grainy as CCTV often is. And it showed uh, a fight on a Glasgow street, maybe 10 or 12 people involved in it. And the taxi pulled, out, pulled up and someone disembarked from the taxi. Someone who had absolutely nothing to do with the row that was taking place. And one of those involved in the row went over and from the CCTV it appeared he had punched him in the side. And as it turned out he hadn't punched him. He stabbed him. And that man died. Uh, and the person responsible was identified and later sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. Uh, but what the presentation was about was tracing back the life of this perpetrator, this person who had murdered uh, an innocent man in the street. He was someone who had come frequently to the attention of the police, uh, often been before the courts, sometimes uh, on charges relating to violence. He had left school without any educational qualifications. And he came from a dysfunctional family. His parents uh, were addicts of either drugs or alcohol. And he had been in and out of care uh, as a young child. So the police officer was leaving the policing board here in Belfast to fly to London to a conference on breastfeeding to give exactly the same presentation. And why was he doing that? Because the evidence shows that children who are breastfed are more likely to, to develop strong bonding and relationship with the mother. And it's also beneficial to the mother in terms of building relationships with, uh, with her child. So I'm sure most of us now are familiar with ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And the evidence shows that children who have suffered a number of adverse childhood experiences are more likely to end up 
in the criminal justice system. And those are issues that we need to deal with. And it's not just a matter for the justice minister to deal with. So take even for example that particular case uh, that I have just outlined there and the different agencies and statutory bodies that could have intervened at different stages early in that person's life. Perhaps there would be a different outcome. Perhaps there wouldn't have been a man lying bleeding to death on the streets of Glasgow. And just imagine a situation here. Uh, a family living in poverty, living in cold, uh, a cold, damp, mouldy house. The children may be suffering from respiratory illnesses, maybe bronchitis or asthma, and that condition being exacerbated by the conditions that they're living in. Uh, and as a result, the children become ill more frequently. That then leads to, to longer absences from school. They continue to fall behind in school and don't make up. And what happens then? The evidence again shows us that children who leave school without qualifications are not only likely to end up with chronic illnesses, they're more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. So uh, if we're going to talk about collaboration, it's across uh, many spectrums. Uh, we have to deal with poverty, uh, education has to be beefed up, the criminal justice system has a role, the housing executive has a role, uh, uh, so collaboration is the name of the game here. Certainly. Well, I've listened with interest to what the member is saying, but will he also accept, because I think sometimes in these debates we focus in, in the issues which are context, but let's remember violent crime is carried out by some people from very affluent parts of society, and they have access to money and to other individuals. So while I concur with many of the comments that the member is making, it can't just exclusively be left to saying if we solve the issues socially and economically that we would eradicate crime from our society. I thank the member for uh, that intervention, um, and I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, we're, we're, we're never going to eradicate crime completely from society. What we need to do is uh, get everyone on to an equal footing, give everybody the best start in life that we can. Uh, children shouldn't be punished because they grew up in poverty or because they had uh, parents who had bad or no parenting skills or because those parents were uh, addicted to drugs or alcohol. Uh, we need to do what's best for the greatest number of people it, in society. Yes. Well, will the member acknowledge the fact that in any mapping exercise of the prison population, it will show up the dis disparities in terms of high levels of uh, deprivation and poverty is where most of the people who are in prison serving jail sentences come from, and therefore the link between poverty and deprivation is well established? I thank the member for that, and uh, our point is well made. Uh, the, the evidence is clear that the prisons are full mainly of uh, people from disadvantaged areas, and large percentages of, of the prison population are uh, uh, either involved in self-harming, in substance abuse, have suicidal tendencies, or have mental health problems. Uh, so we need to deal with all those issues that lead the people uh, going into prison. And I'm glad uh, to welcome the, uh, the, the, the pilot, pilots that uh, are taking place and will be taking place in the, in, in the future uh, on problem-solving courts uh, dealing with addiction and mental health. And the aim is to do exactly what it says on the tin, to solve the problems that bring people before the courts. So if people are persistently reoffending people who have mental health issues or addiction issues, that they can get help with those issues rather than constantly going in like a revolving door, back out, back in, back out, back in, uh, the same all the time. And can the uh, just, to, march the close? just to come to the last point, Ronnie Armour, the director of prisons, was in front of the committee there recently uh, and spoke about his emphasis now being 
on rehabilitation within the prisons, and that's something where we need to place emphasis as well. Colonel Maggot. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support the SDLP motion, um, uh, and we will support both amendments as well, because both amendments uh, add value um, to the motion. Anything that adds value um, to the motion uh, is a good thing, uh, and, and I think we are all agreed here um, what we're trying to do is, is set something in motion here to help deal with the problem of, of violent crime. When I reflect on the debate, I reflect on all of the things we're trying to look at. Victims, punishment, rehabilitation, protections, separated communities, social isolation, vulnerability, alcohol and drug abuse, mental health, sentencing, public confidence, accountability. Victims. Victims. Sometimes in everything we do, we sometimes forget about the victim. Yes, we don't want to stop having victims, but we will have victims and we need to think about them. And I maybe address that in a, in a little while. Uh, and I think everybody's agreed that this is for all departments, not just justice, but health and communities and for infrastructure. Um, it, it affects absolutely everybody. There's been lots of debate about the domestic abuse, um, uh, and, and I listened intently to some of it. Um, I, I listened to the chair uh, of the Justice Committee when he gave horrific statistics of the amount of domestic abuse in the, in the last 12 months. Um, uh, and I would add to that that 27% of children within a domestic, um, domestic violent home have been physically abused. And I say that today as pretty horrific news comes out of Larne about a terrible incident. But it is something that we have to address. And of course, please don't forget about men, because one in nine men are victims of those statistics. One in nine are men who are victims of domestic abuse. But men are less likely to come forward and say they are victims of domestic uh, abuse. In fact, in a recent survey, 20% of people thought that men who are victims of domestic abuse deserved it. But domestic abuse doesn't sit alone. Of course, violent crimes against the vulnerable, particularly the elderly, are increasing. Uh, as, as Dolores said, we're discussing that um, tomorrow, so I won't go into that in any great depth. But I reflect back to the causes of violent crime, and one of those causes is mental health. Mental health is a huge issue. If we have a problem at the minute with domestic violence um, being at crime epidemic level, so is mental health. And we need a comprehensive mental health strategy that victims can feed into. I'm working with the family of Mr. and Mrs. Cowdery, who's, who were murdered um, in 2017. And the family have been fighting for justice for their family. Pretty horrific circumstances uh, they've had to fight through. And they haven't really had the support they need. And they have been fighting against the Department for Health and the Department for Justice in order to get the help to deal with the serious incident, uh, sorry, the serious adverse incident report, which was seriously flawed. And this, for them, has cost them their own mental health, and they haven't had that support. And what we're finding here is we are traumatizing victims as they fight to get justice, as they fight for support, as they fight to understand why they are victims in the first place. So yes, we have to deal with the causes of mental health, but when it all goes wrong, we have to deal with those people who are the victims. I raised it with the, the Minister for Justice in, in the Justice Committee, and she gave a very good answer, a fair answer. But I'm really wondering still, is there need to be a wider debate to have an overarching Victims of Crime Commissioner? Of course, we have a Victims Commissioner for Troubles Crimes. We may well need a victim's commissioner for domestic abuse. I would have no problems with that. But what about all of the other victims? What about those victims of crime who need somebody to stand up for them, to link between those different departments that we all agree should be working together? I think there's merit in it. I think it certainly needs a, a bigger argument. Speaking to the family and asking, what would a commissioner have done for you? There would have been a voice for the victims. The justice system only works when it delivers justice for both victim and offender, and justice for victims need their voices to be heard. It's hard to argue with that. And I could go on, 
And I guess the point is well made there. We need to look at victims as much as we look at the perpetrators. Deal with the perpetrators, but let's not forget about the victims. Thank you. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party and can tell the House that Alliance can support the original motion, which came with the name, first of all, of Dolores Kelly. And we can do that not least of all because the motion calls for, and members will have read it, increased collaborative approaches to crime and the causes of crime. And the motion also makes specific reference um, to victims and to communities and the effect of crime on those two groups of people. The emphasis on collaboration, Deputy Speaker, also makes it easy to support the amendment which comes in the name of Linda Dillon um, and others, as this asks the Minister to seek solutions, not simply on a collaborative basis, but also on an executive-wide basis. Um, Alliance is not in a position to support the additional amendment from uh, the first name of Mervyn's story on it, uh, due to this amendment's uh, restrictive uh, reference, uh, uh, consistent restrictive reference to criminal justice solutions and the focus on those only, with no reference uh, to prevention, to intervention or to rehabilitation. And we think in this context that is not helpful because we have to seek solutions uh, on a wider basis. The reality is, uh, in reference to that, Deputy Speaker, there are already some uh, very productive joined up approaches out there to, to the problems that have been highlighted already during the debate. And hopefully, when the Minister speaks, she can elaborate on some of these, such as substance abuse courts, support hubs, uh, and these are growing phenomenon, and multi agency triage teams, which are helping out there in the field also. Um, these are approaches that are vital if we are to realistic ta realistically tackle the drugs and alcohol-related issues, which have been spoken about already a number of times. Um, there are also additional approaches if we wish to seriously nurture a society of lawfulness. For example, visible support by all of us, an interaction with police from schools through colleges through public life and universities to employment settings the family hubs that have been mentioned, and wider in society also. We need, to we need to encourage understanding and solutions rather than judgment and stigma in relation to addiction matters, it could be argued. We need also to have mature discussions around real-life issues such as abuse of prescription drugs on an everyday basis. The collaborative approaches requested in the original motion and the amendment for which I have already expressed alliance support are crucial next stages in this process and in seeking understanding as well as solutions, Deputy Speaker. And I therefore express our support for the original motion and the amendment that I have outlined. Thank you. I call Paul Frew. And I rise again to, to acknowledge the good work by private members bringing this forward uh, today. It is it's of no uh, accident that since we have been back in this place, we have had uh, a motion on climate emergency, and then we are having three on crime. Uh, one here today, one on paramilitarism next, and then tomorrow the crime against older people. And I think that speaks volumes, and I, I do believe that the members have, have hit on something out there, uh, crime and the fear of crime and the impact that that has on society. And many members here have talked about crime statistics and how they rise and how they fall, but usually how they rise and how they rise and how they rise. And I see that, I see two things. I see a real problem, but I also see an uncovering of a problem. Because it's probably the truth that for far too long, domestic violence was taking place behind closed doors behind walls, and we didn't know, or we didn't want to know. And that would be shameful of any society if that were the case. But now that we do know, we have to do something about it. And, and I would appeal to the Minister again, uh, because I know that this is one of the things that she is going to take very seriously, and it is a priority for her. 
uh, but we need to see this legislation as quickly as possible and we need to see it implemented as quickly as possible and we need the PSNI to take it seriously. Uh, legislative basis will do that. I'm not saying that they're not taking it seriously now, but they need the tools at their disposal in order to make this problem right. And it is a massive problem. I, I, I like many members here, could probably talk, tell stories about domestic violence cases or suspicions. And there was one time when I did witness things out in the back garden, and it just happened to be that that domestic violence manifested itself outside. It continued out, and, and then people were able to witness that. And I also have experience whereby one punch, one punch has devastated lives. It's de devastated the life of one individual, but also all the family connected to that. Uh, and that's hard to take. It's hard to take for friends and family. It's hard to take for the individual. And Doug's right when he says about victims. And a question that has to be posed here is, do we support victims properly? Do we really? Do we give them the support they need to recover, both in all factors and sectors of our society and our government, and all our departments? Uh, and that's something we need to really take seriously. And, and, need to, and detail is important here. It's detail that raised about the issue about people being missed in the system and maybe through experiences in their younger days, return or turn to violence and believe that to be an acceptable way of behaviour. And I get all that, but somewhere along the line, someone was failed. And then it leads to a completely innocent person being in the wrong place at the wrong time and dying, or devastating injuries that affects their life for the rest of their life and also their families. And that's very, very important. And it seems to be the case that it's mostly drug and alcohol fueled, abuse of alcohol fueled. And that's something I think we need to tackle also. Because I think that it's only if the ones who don't realise or see the drugs in our society are probably the most naive among us. And that's something that has to change. And we need to shine a light on all of this. Violent crime is not acceptable. Violence is not acceptable. Whether it be at the home, whether it be a sporting event, whether it be yes I will, yep. I thank the member for giving way, and he's made reference to domestic abuse, but does he believe fundamentally um, by breaking the stigma of domestic abuse we will help eradicate it from our society? The member is an extra minute. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, and thanks for the introduction. I, I believe we, we must open a, shine a light and open the doors on this issue. No one should be subject and victimised to do with domestic violence or any sort of violence. But I want to raise something that's close to my heart in my remaining time. And I would like the House to take cognizance of this. Before this assembly fell, I had a private member's bill going through, and it was to protect uh, accident staff, accident emergency staff, uh, nurses, who are at the cutting edge and who are abused daily, sometimes violently. And I think that's something that we really need to pick up. Uh, and I look forward to miscellaneous bills coming forward, so I get the chance. And I know Dolores is very keen on, on miscellaneous bills too. Uh, we could work maybe as a double act, as we always have done. But it's very, very important that we protect people who protect us, and that we give tougher sentencing for assaults on those people, because they have a double impact, not only on the victim, but if that victim then is out of service or can't do their job, people will die. People will die because of that. So that has an indirect impact on someone else's life, on another family's life, which probably will never be able to connect or be told or, can, or, or join up. But that will be devastation for one, uh, yet another family. And that's very, very important. And I think this House Could should take uh, cognizance of that, that we should protect the people who protect us in, in, this, in this country. Thank you. I call Martina Anderson. Going me August and ask can call August by all on Lords if over and Moon Shaw. I would like to support this motion on violent crime in addition to the Sinn Féin proposed amendment to the text. In 2019, there were over 3,000 incidents of domestic violence of violent crime in Derry, in my hometown making up nearly a third of all reported crimes, a 21% increase since 2018. Derry is in crisis. 
a crisis caused by a decade of neglect, driven by a lack of opportunities for young people, lack of public services, lack of quality jobs and a lack of income support. And I say that because I agree with what was said around the statistical evidence showing the link between poverty and economic deprivation and how that has been identified as one of the root causes of violent crime. Therefore, that link makes it all the more important for the executive to tackle and address regional inequalities and to do so, I believe, to deliver resources based on objective need. This also includes developing legislation to address the, the impact of the fear of crime on our elderly population, but that is being discussed further tomorrow, so I'll not go into much more on that. Um, as the, at the Justice Committee last week, we members uh, were given shocking statistics by, by the Minister regarding 90% of the prison population having some form of alcohol and drug, drug substance issues. And given the link between a high volume of violent crime fueled by alcohol and drugs, then those who own clubs and pubs should not be possibly indirectly fueling such crime by drinks promotions in our city centres. In Derry, nearly half of all violent crimes are domestic abuse crimes. Derry has the uh, yeah. point that I just made earlier. I want to thank you for giving way to me. But in my past business, I was involved with public houses, and I cannot stress enough that within that controlled atmosphere, we should not be labelled with all of the ills of society. Most of that drink is cheap drink which is bought uh, in supermarkets and fueled well long before they even go out for that night's socialising. In fact, just to, to make it really plain here, I'm sorry, I'm, th thank you very much. I'm going to speed this up as quickly as I can. You cannot blame all of the ills of, of alcohol abuse at the doors of public or public houses. The member's next minute. Well, I would ask the member not to get too defensive about this, and perhaps if he had been listening to what I was saying, he's, I said possibly indirectly fueling. So I didn't actually accuse, but I did say there was an onus and responsibility on those who own clubs and on pubs to make sure that in relation to drinks promotion that they understand the link. So going back to what I was saying with regards to Derry has the highest level of domestic violence incidents in the north and according to the PSNI there were 1,519 domestic abuse crimes recorded last year alone. That is four crimes per day, four too many. Domestic violence is not confined by age, gender or sexuality, yet it is staggering, absolutely staggering, that 67% of victims of domestic violence are females, while 86% of abusers are male. I would like to express my appreciation to a local organisation who supports victims such as La Dos Fida in Derry and the Men's Action Network. In particular, I would also like to commend the work done by Foil Women's Aid, who supports nearly 3,000 women and children a year who are directly affected by domestic abuse. Last year, domestic abuse incidents increased by 6% and represented 16%, we're told, of all crimes recorded in the North. It is unfortunate but also welcome that more women are seeking help for domestic abuse, yet there are still countless, countless other victims suffering in silence who are trapped behind closed doors, and I would like to address them today, where every call, text message or post on social media is scrutinised by your abuser, where you are forced to do things because if you do not your abuser will hit you or your child. And when you are led to believe that everything is your own fault and that you are alone in this world, do not feel isolated. There are organisations like the Dulce Vita and Foyles Women Aid and Women Aid all over the North that are there to help you. Domestic abuse can be physical, emotional, sexual and violent abuse. 
the Dulce Vida project in Derry, which offers one-to-one -one counselling for those impacted by domestic abuse, has been doing sterling work highlighting the impact of parental alienation and perpetrators who unfortunately use the courts to further domestic abuse. I spoke to the Minister about this at the committee last week. Parental alienation is recognised by the World Health Organisation as emotional, physical harm caused to children by the parent-child relation, and I would ask the Minister to consider it in the Domestic Violence Bill in the time ahead. There's much, much more I could say, but time does not permit me. Go on, I call Gordon Dunn. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on our amendment to this very important issue, which highlights the fact that violent crime alongside alcohol and drug-related offences are on the increase. The PSNI statistics confirm an alarming trend with over 106,000 recorded offences during the calendar year 2019, an increase of over 7 per cent when compared with the previous 12 months in 2018. All but one of the policing districts experienced a higher level of crime last year compared to the previous years, with the Ards and North Down policing district within my own constituency being the only district with a 2.2 per cent reduction in police recorded crime in 2019 compared to 2018. Alcohol and drug abuse are main contributing factors, financially costing this country hundreds of millions of pounds every year and tragically costing too many lives. Between July 2018 and June 2019, there were 16,575 domestic abuse crimes recorded here, which represents an alarming increase of 10 per cent on the previous 12 months, which is the highest rec since records began in 2004-2005. Statistics also show an alarming increase in attacks on children, young people and women. The PSNI defends domestic abuse as violent abusive or threatening, controlling, coercive behaviour by a partner, ex-partner or family member, and abuse can be physical, sexual, verbal, emotional or financial in nature. Domestic abuse is a much wider term than one may think, and is also an ever-evolving issue with the digital age now that we all live in, opening up so many new challenges. It is worth acknowledging that there have been many efforts made at every level within our society from within our community and voluntary sector right through to executive level to try and tackle this issue. I think we have seen a greater awareness and understanding of this issue today through education and effective public awareness campaigns, which have highlighted this devastating impact that violent crime, drug and alcohol abuse can have on our people's, people's lives, families and our communities. It is important that people speak out and speak up and are not afraid to have hearing their voices being heard. In relation to justice for victims of violent crime, it is important that the punishment fits the crime. As an example, it was highlighted in our, in our local paper, The Bangor Spectator, last weekend, when the headline story was about a bottle attack victim who was left with 15 stitches to his face, and his violent attacker, who had a criminal record of 116 convictions, escaped jail and was instead given 100 hours of community service and was put on probation for three months, leaving the victim and his family disgusted with the judicial system. Member I, yes, I will indeed. On that point, would the member agree with me that the, the case in which he talks about does nothing but bring additional terror to that family who have to live day and daily knowing that the perpetrator is back on the street so quick? And the member's next to minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his intervention. And the issue is the, the risk that, that, that our, our whole community is put to because the perpetrator is still at large. A joined up multi agency partnership based approach is crucial going forward with the PSNI, councils, PCSPs, community and voluntary groups working alongside our elected representatives to tackle this problem. Voluntary groups play an important part like the Ards and North Down street pastors within my own constituency, who are often at the front line on, on dark, wet nights working with those affected by alcohol and drugs, they play a very valuable role in preventing violent crime and must be commended. They even go as far as collecting empty glass bottles, which they recognise is a, a weapon if it gets into the wrong hands. 
New PSNI neighbourhood police teams, the NPTs as they are now known, which have recently been rolled out, play a very important role within our communities. And we greatly welcome that and we are delighted to see local police in, within our communities within North Down, people that we know and we get to know and the public gain confidence in. There is also an important body of work around preventing adverse childhood experiences, which include exposure to family alcohol and drugs abuse, misuse and domestic abuse through greater support for families and young people, with education playing an important role in improving future outcomes and earlier intervention. Finally, Mr. Speaker, we must continue to strive for better, and I believe we must see tougher sentencing introduced to deter perpetrators alongside progress on delivering the legislation on protecting victims of crime. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today on this motion um, on violent crime. And I also welcome the level of engagement that there has been on this motion and the level of input from other parties. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it was an American legislator that once referenced what he called the mindless menace of violence which stains our land and every one of our lives. Most regrettably, 50 years on, this mindless menace of violence still overshadows our land and continues to affect uh, the lives of all. All across the North, men and women suffer uh, oftentimes in the most awful silence uh, because of domestic violence. Then victims and survivors of institutional abuse have suffered for years as they have sought to speak truth to power and let their story be heard and the evil uh, perpetrated upon them rooted out and brought into the light. Young and old alike are attacked in their homes and in our very streets and they must then piece together their lives afterwards. Uh, this looming shadow which stains our land and our lives has a name, and it is that of violent crime. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, my constituency is in many ways a rural one, and my hometown of Downpatrick is not exempt from that looming shadow. Last year alone, the PSNI in the Downpatrick area, there were 2,395 recorded acts of antisocial behaviour, 1,619 acts of violence and sexual offences, and 837 acts of criminal damage and arson. However, the most harrowing truth of this matter is that we may never know the total levels of violent crime currently occurring across the North, as many people still feel unable to come forward and tell their story. Members, if you, like me, feel the same sense of moral outrage at how this Assembly did not sit for over three years and did not legislate to combat this shadow of violent crime, then you will agree that we must do more. The sad reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the majority of cases of violent crime are underpinned by alcohol or drug consumption. We must be doing more to rid our society of the scourge of alcohol and drug abuse. Now, I am careful, Mr. Speaker, to note that I am not referencing the overwhelming number of people who can have a glass of tea or wine or have a few pints, but I am referencing those that, um, those that get so intoxicated that they cannot control I their behaviour. Yep, sure. Would the member agree also that poverty plays a huge part in these violent crimes that, that are a scourge on, on our society? Um, I know within my own constituency and of the town that you're talking of, one child that was brought home to his parents by the PSNI one evening for, for, for antisocial behaviour, which can then go on and lead to violent crimes. And when the, the, the PSNI officer took him home, there was one light bulb in the house. One light bulb, no food in the fridge, nothing in the cupboards, and they had to take a burning light bulb out of the, the ceiling upstairs and bring it down to light the living room so, so the, the parents could have a conversation with the PSNI about their child's behaviour. And a collaborative approach is also needed in this, um, in dealing with this and, and dealing with the mental health issues, addiction and poverty, and it, it creates a huge, it's a huge problem. Can, can I remind members that interventions should be brief? And the, minute, the member has an extra minute. Thank you. And I, I thank the intervention. I think we've got a range of issues that we need to try and address and try and tackle. And it was how, uh, in a debate earlier here today, I'd referenced the need for the executive to deliver on an anti-poverty strategy, because that will start to combat the poverty that there is in our community and would then allow uh, for some people to be receiving help and assistance, which may uh, mean that they don't have to be in the circumstances that are mentioned. 
But um, for those that, uh, in terms of the alcohol and drug abuse, I was referencing those that get so intoxicated that they cannot control their behaviour. And that could be maybe just a complete stranger in the street, uh, or it could be a partner at home that feels the brunt of that abusive behaviour at the end of the night. So we must do more and see more action from the police too, who often get exposed to such violent crime and become the needless targets of such crime as well. Uh, and the interventions need to start earlier. I, mean, I welcome the announcement by the police service uh, a number of months ago uh, before this assembly reconvened to deploy extra officers back into the community beats or neighbourhood area teams. These officers operated at the coal face, but they were a permanent fixture. People knew them and they knew people, and those relationships and that network of contacts was used to challenge issues in local communities. I look forward to seeing them again in areas like Downpatrick. We currently have issues with large groups of young people gathering on Friday afternoons trying to get passing 18-year-olds to purchase drink for them. If successful, they are consuming large amounts of alcohol, and then the behaviour goes downhill. In recent weeks, we have had assaults, threats, intimidation, drug consumption and criminal damage, but the root cause is all the same. Large volumes of alcohol are being consumed. I want to see the new officers in place soon uh, and challenging this behaviour in Downpatrick, and I hope that maybe the Minister could tell us today when those new officers will be in place. We must do more to change attitudes. We must do more to combat paramilitaries who continue to wreak havoc across the north. We must do more to seek ways to prevent reoffending, and we must do more to encourage those who have been the victims of crime to speak up. Most importantly, when they do, we must do more to support the victims. Mr. Speaker, it was the SDLP who brought this the motion to the Assembly, Martin, not the Executive or the Department. And we want to see this action and see a positive action being used to challenge these events. Thank you, Mr. Deputy I Speaker. call Alan Chambers. Speaker, uh, I welcome this motion and the opportunity to speak about the important issues it raises. I also welcome the fact that it recognises the effect of such crime on victims. It is easy for victims to be forgotten as they are often absorbed into just becoming official statistics. A victim of a violent crime does not seek to become one. However, once someone decides to make them a victim, they are plunged into a world that may be completely alien to them. They will be expected to engage with police officers investigating the crime, an experience that some people not used to engaging with the police may find a daunting challenge. They may also have to face the ordeal of attending an identity parade, followed by long days sitting in a courtroom if a suspect is charged and a case is made against their assailant. This will be followed by a grilling from the defendant's barrister when they enter the witness box. They may then decide to seek compensation, which they are legally entitled to for their injuries, both physical and mental. That can become the biggest ordeal for the victim of all that they have had to face to that point. Suddenly, they may feel that they have become the person standing in the dock, been faced down, rather than supported by the authorities. I have been there. My family have been there, all because we run a family retail business that trades in cash. My daughter, who was 16 at the time, was present in the shop when an armed gang entered the premises and ordered customers to the floor at gunpoint. My daughter had the barrel of a gun placed in their mouth by an assailant who was reeking of alcohol to make her compliant with the robber's demands. I shared the trauma of her attempting to cope with this incident. She attended psychological counselling for over a year to help deal with it. Her claim for compensation from the criminal injuries compensation scheme was initially rejected, and after appearing at an appeals hearing, she was granted the minimum award. In my own case, I was attacked late one Sunday evening by an assailant wielding a hatchet who pushed me to the ground and hit me several times around the legs with the weapon and drawing blood. In the meantime, my wife was being threatened by the other robber waving a hammer around her head. These events made us both extremely apprehensive of every stranger that came through the door of the business for months afterwards. Yes? I'm grateful to the member for giving way, and I want to put on record uh, high praise for him for sharing his experience with us. In the context of what the member has just said, 
Does he not find it incredible that people think that the DUP amendment is too focused on the criminal justice system? People that behave in that manner should be subject to the full rigour of the criminal justice system. So you thank the, the member for that intervention. Absolutely. I was rejected for compensation as my injuries did not meet the threshold, nor had I sought professional help for my psychological ordeal. I also had not lost any time off work, and that apparently went against me. Other self-employed business people will know that they do not enjoy the luxury of taking time off work while they are still standing. A High Court judge thought the ordeal was worthy of an eight-year custodial sentence for my assailant after a jury found him guilty of causing me actual bodily harm. Obviously, a pen pusher in the compensation service did not share the learned judge's opinion, nor that of the jury, of what had happened to me. My experiences give me no confidence that victims of violent crime are considered as anything more than a number. More care and support for victims should be the trademark of any caring and compassionate government. I had experience of dealing with government agencies through my political activities, but still run in the stone wall of negativity that I struggled, struggled to penetrate. What chance has the average citizen of coping with a system that appears to be designed to knock them back rather than recognizing what they have been put through by a situation not of their own making? The personal experiences I have alluded to are only a few examples of robberies and crime my family business has been subjected to over the years. The common denominator has been that they all have been driven by criminals attempting to obtain money for drugs. This is the catalyst that needs to be addressed. Violent crime is not about getting money to put food on a table, but rather to steal money or goods to settle drugs debts. They will always target the softest targets. Their violence is driven by the urgent need to feed their drug habit. Two of the people involved in robberies at my business both died suddenly as a result of drug abuse some months after attacking us. I believe that another vulnerable group subject to violence is our frontline emergency personnel. Courts should take a zero tolerance approach to attacks on fire, police, ambulance and medical staff. We should ensure that the courts have the tools to make such violence unattractive by allowing them to impose sentences that are a serious deterrent. We owe this duty of care to our emergency services. It should be said by way of reassurance that the vast majority of our citizens will never fall victim to a violent crime. This is not to minimize the impact on those who have fallen victim. We must ensure that the police have the resources to thoroughly investigate such crimes with full and unfettered access to forensic services. The courts should also have available a range of sentences that recognize and reflect the seriousness of violent contact, uh, conduct. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I call Claire Sugton, and the member will have the remaining five minutes of this debate. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support the motion, and despite being mutually exclusive, I support both amendments, as each raises important considerations about how we genuinely and effectively tackle violent crime in Northern Ireland. I will, however, prioritise my support for Amendment 2. This amendment encourages a Northern Ireland executive approach to tackle the issues by addressing the root cause of the problem rather than the symptoms. I will, however, acknowledge Amendment 1, uh, tabled by Mr Storey and Mr Given. Um, if Amendment 1 was its own standalone motion, um, you would have my full support. But unfortunately, it competes with Amendment 2, which I see as the most realistic and long-term route for tackling violent crime, including the various types noted within that amendment. I am not entirely content with the wording of the original motion, but I support the general principle that identifies the relationship between violent crime and alcohol and drugs and the harm it causes within communities. I would prefer that we call on all ministers within the Northern Ireland Executive to address this issue rather than just the Minister of Justice and the Minister in Health, which is why I lend my support to Amendment 2. Um, please, Minister, bear with me when I say that the Department of Justice could be described as the Department of Failure. Where all other departments have failed in providing high-quality public services, protecting the most vulnerable within society, and offering genuine opportunities for children and young people for a better life, the Department of Justice picks up the pieces. When a perpetrator commits a crime, it is too late. Too late for the victim, for their families, too late for wider society, too late for the perpetrator, and too late for public finances. 
So what point is not too late? Adulthood, early adulthood, adolescence, childhood, early years, or even in the womb. The point I am trying to make is that I believe that no one is born bad, and definitely not born a perpetrator of violent crime, or indeed any other type of crime. They are a product of their environment, circumstances, and opportunities. Not having a roof over their head, a hot meal on the table, access to quality education will affect the people they become. If government, whose job it is to serve and protect its people by providing a minimum public service, as outlined above, does not do that, then those people will turn to crime and criminality dressed up as paramilitarism. It's the cost of failure, and all society will suffer. So as well as calling on the Minister of Justice, I call on every minister in the Northern Ireland Executive. Do your job, work together, provide public services, improve on what we have, so violent crime, paramilitary activity, or any other type of criminal behaviour is not the preferred option. It is inevitable that we will address symptoms of a broken society and poor public services, and people will commit crimes. But maybe we take a walk upstream and address where these problems began. There is no point in emptying the sink if you do not turn off the tap. The correlation between the rise um, of crime and alcohol and drug-related offences um, is entirely valid. Again, we can seek to address alcohol and drug abuse-related crime, or we can try understanding why people are abusing alcohol and drugs, which leads them on a path of criminal behaviour. I suspect much is to do with poor mental health and early childhood trauma, amongst other reasons, and I really appreciate a number of the members acknowledging the impact of trauma and sharing their own stories. At this point, I do want to stress that I am not providing excuses for criminal behaviour. I am providing reasons with the hope that if we address these reasons, then we prevent crime, and most importantly, we prevent victims. There are a considerable number of incidents of domestic abuse reported to the police each year. It does not bear thinking the number that go unreported. And despite the shortcomings of this assembly not to sit for three years, I genuinely don't understand why it took so long to address this issue. It is society's shame. It is the shame of this assembly that we have not legislated before now. Our shame that a wooden table has more justice in Northern Ireland than a victim of domestic abuse. I fully support and commend the Minister for agreeing to bring forward this legislation as soon as possible. I understand that it can happen here as quickly as in Westminster and we can tailor it to meet our specific needs. Mr. Speaker, I sought to address domestic abuse for a number of reasons. Can I ask Member John March to close? Uh, not least because of the reasons outlined above. But domestic abuse in itself is a trauma which can lead to mental health and addiction issues that can then lead to criminal behaviour. We need to break that cycle. We can do it by domestic abuse, but we need to look wider at other traumas. Thank you. And I call on Linda Dillon to wind on amendment number two. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Apologies. Mr. I has called the Justice Minister Naomi Long uh, to respond to the debate. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I want to put on record my gratitude to the members for Upper Band, South Down and Mid-Ulster for bringing this motion um, to the House and also to those who have brought amendments this afternoon to expand on the debate that we have had. I also want to thank all of those who participated in the discussions today and I very much welcome the opportunity to respond. I share members' concern in relation to violent crime. No crime is acceptable, and those which involve violence can be particularly traumatic for the victim. It is, however, important to remember at the outset that with some of the crimes that involve violence against the person, such as domestic violence, the statistics are rising at least partially as a result in an increase in support for victims to report and the, cons the consequential increase in reporting levels. The more we know about these types of crimes, the more we can try to address them effectively. And whilst I would again stress that no crime, particularly violent crime, is acceptable, I believe it's also important to reassure members of this Assembly, and importantly members of the public, that levels of crime across Northern Ireland generally are low. Police recorded crime statistics show us that it's about 40% lower in Northern Ireland than in England and Wales. Nonetheless, I recognise that is no comfort for victims. Alan Chambers, I think, set out very passionately the wider long-term consequences of violent crime for those who are affected by it. Ensuring the communities are safe, resilient and supported is an absolute priority for me. 
I am also very conscious of the underlying issues and risk factors which increase the likelihood of people offending, as set out by Mr Pat Sheehan and others today. And I want to take some time to set out the work my department is doing to address this. In terms of alcohol and drugs, we recognise that drugs and alcohol misuse is cross-cutting and is impacting on people's lives at every level in Northern Ireland. It can lead to crime committed to fuel drug dependence, fuel the organised criminality and violence and exploitation that often goes hand in hand with the production and supply and paramilitarism. It can also cause untold damage and loss to families and individuals. It's difficult to know exactly how many people in Northern Ireland are using illicit drugs or misusing prescription drugs. However, I, like others, am concerned by the apparent upward trend in risk-taking behaviour, as evidenced by increases across seizures, arrests and, most worryingly, drug-related deaths. I am committed to ongoing work with partners to end the harm caused by the illicit supply and misuse of drugs and alcohol, and my department and law enforcement agencies clearly have key roles to play in this. However, as Dolores Kelly and others rightly stated, it is also clear that these are issues that justice and policing alone cannot solve. They require collaborative, joined-up and holistic responses across a wide range of partners to successfully tackle the interaction between substance misuse and poverty, deprivation, mental health and adverse childhood incidents. And so I'm grateful for the strong partnerships that already exist through the Organised Crime Task Force, through policing and community safety partnerships, drug and alcohol coordination teams and through the structures underpinning delivery of the Department's Health uh, the Department of Health's new strategic direction for alcohol and drugs. The executive has committed to an ongoing cross-departmental response to deal with these issues, and that collaborative approach to improving the prosperity and well-being for all is going to be reflected in the draft programme for government commitments and is reflected in new decade, new approach. Today's debate provides us with an opportunity to reflect on the specific actions which have already been taken forward in the Department of Health-led Executive Strategy, the new Strategic Direction for Alcohol and Drugs Phase 2, to prevent and address the harms related to substance misuse in Northern Ireland. It's also an opportunity to raise the health-led work to, uh, ongoing to shape and develop the new substance misuse strategy, which is aimed at preventing the use and misuse of substances, reducing harm and maintaining recovery. In liaison with health, my department will be focusing on how this new strategy can strengthen the powers to reduce drug supply and support those vulnerable to offending or to being a victim of offending by developing initiatives to identify individuals with problems at an early stage and ensure appropriate action to reduce the harm of substance use is implemented. My department is already engaging with these issues in innovative ways. Ultimately, addressing the root causes of problematic behaviour will result in fewer offenders, fewer victims and more confident and safe families and communities. From a criminal justice perspective, I have a vested interest in this issue as we know that people with drug and alcohol problems and other health-related issues are more likely to come into contact with the justice system. We support work at a local level through PCSPs who work with communities to address community safety concerns and many of these initiatives will help address alcohol and drugs issues in local areas, with one such initiative being the use um, of Remove All Prescription and Illegal Drugs rapid um, bins, which are helping to remove illegal and prescri prescription drugs from the streets. So far, they have proven successful, with tens of thousands of drugs being deposited into those bins located throughout Northern Ireland on a regular basis. The Department has also made a substantial commitment to help tackle the root causes of offending through problem-solving justice approaches, which aim to help reduce harmful behaviour within families and the wider community. There are a number of practical interventions already being delivered. As an early-stage intervention, something which was referenced, I believe, by a number of members, including Colin McGrath, my department works with schools to raise awareness of young people and the consequences of abuse of alcohol and drugs including using dramas such as the play Blackout to explore how misuse can lead to antisocial behaviour or more serious criminal activity and violent crime, leading them to coming to the attention of the criminal justice system. The interagency work of support hubs is another way in which we're working collaboratively to reduce the vulnerability of individuals who may be susceptible to offending through alcohol or drugs use or to being a victim of violent crime. My department will continue to support the development of this model which, in addition to helping to improve people's situation, also reduces the demand on services such as the police, allowing them to focus on crime prevention. 
Finally, the substance misuse courts provide another alternative approach to helping individuals when substance misuse is the underlying problem by seeking to tackle the root causes of their criminal behaviour and providing specialist support and interventions to help people turn their lives around. It allows a judge to direct individuals onto an intensive treatment programme before sentencing to help address their addictions and change their behaviour. While evaluation of this approach is still ongoing, the early indications are positive. That's just three of the problem-solving justice pilot projects that the Department is delivering in order to address the root causes of crime and antisocial behaviour. I believe that through them we are collectively providing effective support to the individuals who most need it and making our communities safer in doing so. <coughs> Supporting individuals is crucial, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. However, a comprehensive response must also deliver effective enforcement action, and I think a number of people have referred to that today. I want to acknowledge the important role um, of the Organised Crime Task Force here in providing a strategic lead in relation to multi-agency activity to disrupt the illicit supply of drugs to our communities and also pay tribute to, to the operational response of law enforcement agencies who are working collaboratively to disrupt the importation, supply and distribution of drugs and who delivered increased operational successes in terms of increased drug seizure incidents and increased drug-related arrests in the 2018-19 financial year. The Organised Crime Task Force is also giving specific focus to the issue of drug-related deaths and is working collaboratively to gain a fuller picture of the issue and causes so that agencies can target resources in the areas of most need, as well as tracking trends and emerging behaviours so that we can respond to them. This work will also inform how we work together with partners in the health and social care and the voluntary sectors to educate the public about the risks of alcohol and substance misuse, particularly those associated with polydrug use. And I concur with comments from John Blair earlier regarding the issue of the misuse of prescription medication in particular, which has very serious consequences. With respect to violent crime, I want to repeat my earlier reassurance that levels of crime across Northern Ireland are relatively low. However, this does not give grounds for complacency. I'm committed to working with partners across government and law enforcement to put in place appropriate measures, both to keep people safe from crime and to reduce the fear of crime within our communities, which Paul Frew rightly identified as often much higher than the actual level of crime, but which can impact on people's freedom to live their lives confidently. Those offenders who are convicted of violent offences may, in, uh, in many circumstances, will be subject to public protection arrangements and will be assessed and managed on a multi-agency basis to ensure that we are keeping the public safe. I'm also pleased that within the current financial year, my department has been able to reinvest nearly £1 million of re uh, recovered criminal assets through uh, the Assets Recovery Community Scheme to support the delivery of projects designed to reduce both crime and the fear of crime across Northern Ireland. Not only does this scheme provide a strong visible message that crime doesn't pay, but by funding projects like a cold calling and DNA marking scheme and other strategic crime prevention initiatives, it is helping to protect often vulnerable individuals and make them feel safer within their own homes and communities. I want to focus for a moment on the importance of feeling safe and of being safe in your own home, because violent crime does not just happen on the streets. Sadly, it often happens within families. It's important to recognise that domestic abuse does not solely involve physical violence, but often controlling coercive behaviours, psychological and financial, that have long-term consequences for the victim and the wider family, as Paul Given noted in his contribution. Worryingly, they're often invisible to those outside the immediate relationship. Domestic abuse is about more than just physical violence. Equally as serious is the often hidden abuse that goes on behind closed doors. While we continue to see an increase in reporting of domestic violence and abuse crimes, this is also a positive reflection of an increased willingness to report to the police and come forward. There is, however, more to be done to further encourage reporting, both through having comprehensive legislation and providing support to those who are affected by domestic abuse. I've already announced my intention to bring a domestic abuse bill forward through the Assembly to create a new domestic abuse offence for Northern Ireland, and I would want to assure Paul Frew that I intend to do so um, with fair wind um, prior to the Easter recess. This will capture patterns of coercive or controlling behaviour and send a clear message that domestic abuse in all its forms is wrong, not just illegal, but culturally unacceptable. Ending the cycle uh, of multi-generational harm and dysfunction to which Pat Sheehan and others referred, and Martina particularly alluded, 
the use and abuse of family courts to maintain contact um, and manipulation of children through parental alienation also needs to be addressed. It will not be possible to make it a specific offence in this bill. However, I would draw the members' attention to the issue of coercive behaviour, which will be covered by the bill, and that any behaviour involving or witnessed by a child is an, an aggravating factor when it comes to sentencing. As part of the bill that I'm bringing forward, crimes with a domestic abuse motivation may also attract increased sentencing as a result of the domestic abuse element as an, aggregate, uh, an aggravating factor, and this is in addition to the new domestic abuse offence. So I think that there are opportunities here to make a real difference, and I want to put on record my thanks to Claire Sugden for the work which she has done. Yeah. I want to turn now also to victim support services. As well as the necessary protections against abuse and violent crime more generally, we need a consistent regional uh, support service for victims and witnesses of crime, as Doug Beattie and others have identified. My department funds Victim Support NI and NSPCC Young Witnesses Service to provide support services to adults and young victims and witnesses of crime. We want to do that by next year. We want to have a new advocacy support service in place for victims of both domestic and sexual abuse that will seek to provide the best possible service within the funding available. In terms of violent sexual crime and the Gillen Review, which I know was raised by Dolores Kelly, I, along with others, am keen to see progress made in relation to those recommendations. Not all will fall to justice to deliver, but my officials are working with criminal justice and voluntary sector organisations, and an action plan is being progressed to ensure, particularly in the first phase, that those recommendations which impact on victims are expedited. Finally, a number of people raised the issue of reducing reoffending. For those who commit violent crime and those affected by it alike, a custodial sentence is an important part of the justice process. It reflects the harm caused to victims in society by their actions and is needed to uphold the rule of law and to maintain public confidence in the justice system. However, a key element in any sentence for those who commit a crime and those who are affected by it must be a focus on rehabilitation to reduce reoffending and ensure positive outcomes. It is incredibly important um, that we see our role in the prisons not just as a punishment, but to keep people safe and to ensure that on release there will be reduced reoffending and ultimately fewer victims of crime. Mr. Speaker, in winding up, I share the concerns that were voiced about the harms caused to our community and to vulnerable individuals through the misuse of drugs, alcohol, and through violent crime. While Northern Ireland continues to have relatively low levels of crime, such statistics can only be cold comfort to individuals who suffer loss as a result of the supply of illicit drugs or who have been victims of violent crime or domestic violence. I'm committed to ongoing work with my executive colleagues to tackle that harm, support and protect the vulnerable, particularly noting the importance of interfaces that exist between my department and that of my colleague, the Health Minister. I look forward to strengthening and deepening our partnerships to deliver against our shared outcome of a safe Northern Ireland where we respect the law and respect each other. Thank you. And I call on Linda Dillon to wind on amendment number two. And can I begin by thanking the Minister for her comments. And I'm not going to go over everything that everyone said, but I am rising to support the motion and to ask people to support Amendment No. 2. Just in, in relation to, obviously, Dolores Kelly outlined some of the issues around Gillen, and I think that's the greatest example of the need for cross-departmental collaboration, because Gillen in his recommendations has touched on every, every single department. Doug Beatty argued for a victims commissioner and I think the minister has already responded to that. No, I don't think anybody is necessarily opposed to it, but you have to decide whether that's the best, best use of, of resources. Um, just in relation to Paul Frew's comments around attacks on healthcare staff, I absolutely agree with what he's saying, but it goes back to what is the root cause because my mother was a, a member of healthcare staff. She worked as a healthcare assistant in Daisy Hill Hospital and she was injured one night, badly injured by a, a patient who injured her accidentally. And she was being encouraged to, to make a statement against that individual and she said, that gentleman is extremely ill. He didn't intend to injure me and therefore I don't feel that any kind of sentence or any kind of judicial process would be beneficial to anybody in this case. And that goes back to then what, what Christopher Stalford said and the reason why we can't support the, the DUP amendment. Whilst, to be fair, in essence, it, it, it is a good, good enough amendment, it probably just has too much focus on, on the 
judicial process and not enough on the tackling the root causes. There's very little that Claire Shogden said that I wouldn't agree with because I think she's absolutely right. If people have reached the judicial system, then we have failed them. We have failed them in every possible way. And I think that's actually the, the essence of this motion. And I, and I have to thank our colleagues in the SDLP for bringing the motion forward. I want to place on record, um, I suppose, my thanks to Alan Chambers for outlining his own personal stories. And I know that isn't, it isn't easy to do. And I have to say that I understand that to be a victim of this type of crime has a lasting impact. And I think that it, it is, you're to be commended for bringing that to the House's attention today. So I suppose just firstly to address our amendment, which is set in the context of, pre of prevention and early inter intervention. It's essential in order to reduce violent crime, whether that is domestic and sexual violence, attacks on our, our elderly or those who are vulnerable. And again, just to outline, those who are vulnerable are the victims of crime. As well, those who are vulnerable are the perpetrators of crime. And that's why we brought forward our amendment. In order to address root causes, all of the departments need to work together. As we well know, people who end up in the criminal justice system overwhelmingly show that they have issues with mental health, substance and alcohol misuse, and come from areas of highest deprivation. There is some good collaborative working going on in some areas, particularly between health and justice, specifically in terms of prisons and PSNA. And whilst this is welcome, by the time the individual has come into contact with the criminal justice system, as we've already outlined, we have failed them. Education and communities have their role to play in terms, particularly around youth service, but also within our school system and identifying where children are at risk. Communities by addressing, obviously, the deprivation and housing need. As DERA also has, particularly in relation to rural crime and isolation, which can make people more vulnerable to be the victim of crime. The Minister of the Economy has, her, has Part of her portfolio needs to look at areas where we can provide skills, training and employment in areas of high deprivation. And the Minister of Finance also has a very important role to play in terms of any strategic approach to dealing with the root causes, as this will have to be financed. So this is the reason that this cannot simply be a matter for justice and health. All departments have their role to play. We need to focus on addressing the root causes. When a violent crime is committed, the punishment must fit the crime, so in that I agree with many members across this House. In particular, where loss of life or serious physical or psychological injury, and subsequent sentencing should re reflect the seriousness of the crime, as this is what families and society as a whole expect. However, nothing can replace the benefit of, pre of prevention, as families who have lost loved ones or who have been victims of violent crime can attest to. We also need to ensure that there is a, a focus on rehabilitation, as this is the only way to effectively tackle reoffending. And the, the minister has alluded to this, and this is something that. Remarks to close. Sorry. We need to have a pr proper strategic approach to ensure that we are implementing good policy that reduces the risk of people ending up in the criminal justice system in the first place. I just want to outline one case that was brought to me recently by a school the, the principal the member's time is up. who said, the, who highlighted to me the, the need for nurture within up. his school. I the think there was some leeway given to others. The need for the nurture the within his school to address this is Thank where you. it begins. I now call on Mervyn Story to wind on Amendment No. 1. I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate as we conclude in regards to the issues that have been raised. And rather than rehearsing, all the issues that have been uh, already raised by members, maybe we could uh, make a few comments in regards to what has uh, brought us to this point. And obviously, we are disappointed that the proposer of the motion uh, isn't accepting our amendment. Uh, and also the fact that when Mr. Blair was making comment, it seems as though there was a part of the amendment uh, that he didn't refer to, <coughs> because if he had read the last part, it says to work collaboratively with the Health Minister and Victims Advocates to introduce an action plan and resource implementation plan. So the issue of dealing with collaboration was there. It's also disappointing, while I welcome the fact that the Minister is with us this evening, it's disappointing that nowhere throughout her comments did she make any reference to the amendments and, and to what her view would be. And I trust that it doesn't send out a signal 
to those people who are a blight in our society, whether or not they are uh, criminals who go under the guise of being paramilitaries, and we'll come on to that uh, shortly, or they are just uh, thugs in our society that are determined to destroy communities and dis destroy people's lives. And we don't send out a message from this House that somehow there is not a place for the criminal justice system. I want to see those who break the law pay the price for doing that. Mm -hmm. And a society that doesn't have that uh, approach, I think, will become, uh, in a way, diverted away from actually seeing those who are responsible for being brought to justice. And I, so therefore, I am somewhat disappointed in the minister and, and the approach that she took, even though uh, the previous minister has indicated to us that her review, which is now complete, uh, gave us a raft of sentencing that needed to be addressed so that we have a judicial system and more importantly, a sentencing regime that is fit for purpose, but more importantly, it fits the crime, and it fits the crime of those who have destroyed lives, those who have... Yes, I will. This is complete, it hasn't actually been enacted yet in terms of any outcomes or conclusions, but also point him to the part of my speech where I said that the criminal justice system had an important role to play, because he must have missed that in my original remarks. The member's next to minute. No, I, I thank uh, the member. And I, I think that this is the place where we have this debate, and I will look forward to seeing what the minister does bring forward, because we can all come to this House, and we can all make comments and put out our comments on Twitter and try to salve our conscience that we have done the best for uh, the people that we claim to represent. But the test will be the legislation that we bring in, which can be enacted and which will be effective in dealing with those who want to break the law and destroy lives. Can I concur with my colleague uh, who moved the motion and the chair of the Justice Committee? And he gave us the statistics I think the sad reality is when we come to debates like this and other debates, we, we use statistics, but as has often been said, and we have been given examples in this House uh, this evening, behind all of those figures, there are individuals, there are families, there are communities who have been destroyed because of those activities. And I think we want to ensure that we don't forget that. In relation to the issue of the statistics. Let's not forget that violent and sexual offences are becoming more prevalent. And there will be no comfort from those who are the uh, victims of those crimes by the Minister saying to us this evening that we are better than the rest of the United Kingdom. While that is the case, and the figures would indicate that that is the case, gives no comfort to those particularly the female victims, crimes against females are becoming more harmful. 40, almost 49% of all violence against person offences. And my colleague gave the figures for those particular crimes. And so we could go down those lists of figures. But I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it would also be important to highlight an issue which came to the policing board just a few weeks ago. And that was in relation to a particular uh, Pathfinder uh, initiative. It is the Pathfinder Custody Nurse Practitioner, CNPs. And that's an initiative that has been in Musgrave Street Police Station. It has seen particularly very good outcomes in terms of the reduction of referrals to the emergency departments from Musgrave Station by some 42 per cent. And I've written to the Health Minister to ensure that the funding is in place the so States? that it cannot be used as a football to determine who pays for the bill rather than going after those and ensuring that those people who need help get the help that they rightfully deserve. Yeah. 
I now call on Patsy McGlone to wind up the debate on the substance of motion. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, and I thank all, all the members who have contributed to the, the uh, debate here today. It's very important. And as my colleague Dolores Kelly started out with, it's um, important and imperative just to, to answer the members across that we have a cross departmental approach to these issues. Many of the issues, she, she cited, school failures, mental health, brought, drawing in education, health, housing, youth services, and indeed, as mentioned during the, the debate there, anti poverty strategies to try and tackle some of the root causes that are associated with violence of this scale. <clears throat> I would also pay tribute just at this point to, uh, and it has been mentioned somewhat, uh, to the likes of Women's Aid and, and Nexus, who are very often at the forefront in providing help and assistance to those most affected and indeed most, uh, through some of the most vulnerable and difficult times of their, their lives. Um, I'm sure all of us here have, through our offices, helped to support people, but we have seen the real good work carried out by those organisations, many occasions uh, quietly beneath the radar, but of vital importance. <clears throat> Paul Given uh, explained the impact of violent crime and that there, it, requ it requires a wider response from society, and he did, not in the direction of an would say that we will support the Sinn Féin amendment. He pointed us he, in the direction of support for that extensive and cross-departmental approach to this issue. He referred to an increase in violent crime, and indeed, like all of us would like, is uh, that sentencing itself should mark the level of the violent crime. But we have to look at some of the root causes of that as well, and that's why that cross-departmental approach. He did cite the evidence of trauma inflicted upon a family, and I suppose many of us have those cases that we can uh, refer to in our own localities. And indeed, some of them, while they, they've been pretty traumatic for the families, I think those that stick out um, for us have been especially those inflicted upon children. And we shouldn't forget those children. There are some, some very, very vicious cases that have come before the courts. And that trauma inflicted upon a family, yes, could be wife, the partner, husband, or it could be those innocents uh, lying in their cots. Um, reference was made to increased offences of drug misuse, alcohol abuse, and we know of those, those instances. Uh, Pat Sheehan went on to make reference to, the, if you like, this three-stranded approach, if we could call it that, the need for legislation, early intervention and rehabilitation, and I thank him for being so concise in outlining that to us. Um, he, did, he went on to refer to the adverse childhood experiences and uh, insights into the prison population, those coming from disadvantaged areas, and uh, attendant issues such as self-harm and suicidal issues, again bringing us back to that issue of health and mental health uh, being uh, often an underlying factor for people who wind up in prison. Doug Beatty uh, did support the motion and the amendments. He made reference to not forgetting about the victims, and I don't think any of us would do that. Uh, some people have come through awful, awful traumas in their lives, and it would be totally immoral to forget those people and not provide the support for them. Sorry, uh, Linda? Yep. We're absolutely not forgetting about the victims in this because very often the perpetrators were themselves victims and that's how they become perpetrators, which is the point, I think. Yes, there is that element of recidivism that uh, comes about and we, we hear of families where indeed that is the case. And uh, some have carried that experience, that family experience with them and inflicted it upon others. And in uh, some of those families indeed, uh, unfortunately, has become accepted behaviour. And that, that too is, is an awful aspect of life within some households. <clears throat> John Blair uh, again referred to increased collaboration, uh, the reference to uh, victims of crime, and to again seek solutions on an education wide basis, cross departmental basis, referred to the Substance Abuse Courts and the multi, multi agency triage. Uh, Paul Frew um, did refer to, to his previous efforts around domestic violence the issues of the one-punch drunk driving 
and uh, the necess necessity to give support to victims. Uh, Johnny Buckley again referred during an intervention to the question of domestic violence and the importance of doing the right thing. And, um, Paul Frew then referred back to the private members' legislation. <clears throat> and indeed, an important point was that for emergency personnel and uh, doctors, nurses, and indeed others who may be subject to, to assaults during the course of trying to care for people. Martina Anderson referred to the incidents of violent crime and particularly cited her own city of Derry, and, um, where uh, there has been a significant increase in the, the amount of problems associated with that, and rightly referred to those problems on the lack of quality jobs, uh, the heightened increases of poverty and urban deprivation associated with that violent crime. Um, Gordon Dunn uh, then referred to the, the necessity for um, the voluntary sector and their involvement with the uh, particular schemes, he cited a number of schemes in, in Bangor, the effect of violent and abusive behaviour, justice for victims and punishment to fit the crime. He also referred to uh, the uh, PCSP, PSNI, Community and Voluntary Group, again a local policy fitting the needs of uh, a local town. <clears throat> Colin McGrath again referred to the issue of people suffering in silence because of awful domestic abuse both young and old, and the need for an anti-poverty strategy to help tackle some of the root causes of violent and criminal behaviour. Uh, he also did refer to the investment and the recent announcement for local policing initiatives and the importance of that where, where local police did know the local areas and the people within those areas, and again referred to the issue of the uh, ability for young people to access alcohol. Uh, and which then leads on to uh, drug use or drug abuse and antisocial behaviour. Alan Chambers uh, told his personal and harrowing story of, of violence, um, and that, that truly must have been traumatic for any family to come through. And uh, I do hope that the proper support was provided to, to you and your family at that time, Alan, and since indeed. Um, the, Claire Sugden uh, referred to her experience at the department and explained really that at the end of the day the department was being expected to pick up the pieces um, and the, the experience of a need for again cross-departmental mental health, education, support and anti-poverty strategy and she was uh, thanked by the minister for her hard work during her time as minister. The minister again uh, during a response referred to cross-departmental, uh, the need for initiatives right cross-departmental, need to, for the vulnerable uh, to be supported, for victims to get the necessary support that they did. And she went on then to cite a number of initiatives from within the department um, to help try and tackle the um, violent behaviour and antisocial behaviour. Referred to the Substance Misuse Court and, in fact, that it and other pilot projects seem to be at this stage rendering some useful benefits in their, in their progress, albeit that they are pilot projects. Uh, yes, she did respond uh, on effective enforcement and re made reference to the Organised Crime Task Force and a multi-agency approach again um, to, to deal with a number of these issues, including where the source of some of this criminal activity is um, organised crime, and we'll be coming along to that later too. Um, the importance of the assets recovery scheme and drawing those assets to put back into the, the community to help support um, efforts to put peace communities back together again. Uh, Linda Dillon um, went back again to the original motivation, and I thank her for it and her intervention, around the necessity, the common theme running right throughout of cross-departmental support, cross-departmental initiatives, and indeed it was referred to during the course of the debate that, that, as a minister, I think, referred to it, that um, as part of the programme for government, that, in fact, would be the case and something which had been adhered to by all the parties. So that might be useful. Um, Mervyn Story said he was disappointed by some of the approaches being taken. But, in conclusion, we support the amendment from Sinn Féin, and given that it does embrace 
that necessary cross-departmental and agency approach to tackle some of the worst excesses of violence and domestic crime. Thank you. Before I put the question on amendment number one, I would remind members that if it is made, I will not be putting the question on amendment number two. The question is that amendment number one, standing in the names of Paul Given and Mervyn Storey, be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. Could I ask members to resume their seat? Order. Order. The question is that amendment number one, standing in the names of Mervyn Story and Paul Given, be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. Do we, do we have tellers?
Order, members. Order. Order. The following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Morris Bradley and George Robinson. Tellers for the nose, Colin McGrath and Linda Dillon. Clear the lobbies. The House will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Secure the doors.
to resume their seats. Order. Clerk, please read the, the result. Simple majority division result. 74 members voted, 32 members voted aye, 42 members voted no. One member who voted in both lobbies is not included in these results. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment falls. The amendment falls. Unfasten the doors. The question now is that amendment number two, standing in the names of Linda Dillon, Martina Anderson and Pat Sheehan, be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now, the question now is that the motion as amended be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs>